Hello everyone. This is Toby from the Phuket Meditation Center and you're listening to the Dharana Meditation Podcast. Let's sit together, calm the busy mind and explore topics concerning character development, meditative training and deeper self-knowledge. So let's begin by sitting upright. The head is gently suspended from above. And the body is relaxed at ease, releasing all the unnecessary tension in your soft tissues. Let it all drop down and melt. So you have a nice balance between uprightness and relaxation. Allow your body to become nice and still, letting go of fidgeting. Being as still in your body is possible. Breathing comfortably in a way that feels nice. Now allow your breath to slowly sink down into the belly. Avoid trying to breathe in a way that you feel you should be breathing because you've read it somewhere or something like that. Instead, breathe truly in a way that feels good to you personally right now. Try to find out what it takes to enjoy your breath.
receive yourself in this moment with kindness, with compassion, or means giving yourself some space, allowing whatever state you're in to be as it is. Treating yourself like somebody that you truly care for. Like somebody that you'd like to be free from stress and suffering. Like somebody that you wish to see happy and at ease. with understanding, with empathy, with warmth. We come to the first stage of the practice, settling the body, breathing in, feel your entire body as one unit of feeling, one cloud of aliveness, if you will, just a sense of bodiness. As you breathe out, releasing through that feeling of the body, softening, let everything melt and Become nice and open. So that at the end of this out breath, you feel slightly better than at the beginning of it. And then you just repeat that, breathing in, feeling the body, breathing out, softening, releasing, and appreciating. We're quite fortunate since there's only this one breath that we are working with. There's nothing else.
so you don't have to be mindful for 30 minutes or something like that. It's perfectly enough to simply be mindful of this one breath. Breathing in, feeling, breathing out, releasing. And appreciating that moment when you feel slightly better, slightly more open, a bit more relaxed. Just taking some time to really take it in, to enjoy it. really important to notice when things get better. Also often people ignore this, they don't look at it and immediately crave for more. Instead of appreciating and enjoying the steps that we make. This will also help to guide your understanding in what feels good for yourself. Helps you to get to know yourself, to get to know your body on a deeper level.
as you become more relaxed, more open in your body, it becomes more easy to be present with this moment. There'll be less of a need to escape, to distract yourself. So in the second stage of the training, we cultivate present moment awareness. Another word is alertness, meaning you know what happens while it happens. Notice where your attention is right now. Maybe going to a sound, hearing. You might be going to a sensation, feeling. You might be going to a thought, thinking. And usually for most of us, the attention is continuously wandering, moving, jumping from sound to sound, from feeling to feeling, from thought to thought. See if you can keep track, if you can remain aware of the movements of your attention. What am I aware of right now? What about now? What about now? It would be incorrect at this stage to control your awareness and to focus on one thing. That's not the task, it's not the advice. The task is to know where your attention is, not to control it. And if it helps you, and for a lot of beginners, this actually is very helpful, you can label. Keep the labeling simple, such as hearing, feeling, thinking. If your attention jumps from one feeling to another, you can simply just keep stating feeling, 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 and so on. And if you're able, then you can drop the labeling completely and simply be aware of what is, 
without any narrative. That would be the third stage. Silence. Gradually let the mind empty out, letting go of thoughts about the past or the future. And letting go of all kinds of thoughts, all words, the narrative. just experiencing what is as it is kind of like a mirror that reflects what is in front of it without talking about it from within this pure experiencing of what is. Rest your attention on the breath. Breathing in, just knowing that you're breathing in. Breathing out, just knowing that you're breathing out. Gently keeping the breath in mind. Every time you notice that your attention wanders off and gets distracted, carefully, calmly, in a relaxed way, return to the breath.
the goal is to train three qualities. One, noticing distraction. So every time you notice that you're distracted, you fulfill that training. Two, remembering the breath, coming back to the breathing. And three, resting with the breathing staying with the breathing. Noticing distraction, returning to the breath, and remaining with the breath. It's like being in the gym, training three muscles. Notice how I didn't say, be perfectly concentrated at all times and don't be distracted. That's not the instruction. Notice distraction, return to the breath and remain with the breath. Of course, remaining with the breath means for as long as you can before your mind kicks you out. Fortunately, there is only this one breath. And in your own time, while remaining centered, 
in the awareness of breathing. You can slowly return and stretch a little bit, open your eyes. Remember that even while you're opening your eyes, you can still know whether you're breathing in or out. You can still know that even while you're stretching. All right, welcome everyone. It's nice to have all of you. Okay, so today I received a, like a question from Anna. And so she explains a little bit. I do have a question related to ardency. I'll give you a bit of context. Ardency is a topic I'm familiar with. I've been extremely dedicated to the study of Jyotish for a few years now, and my daily routine revolves around it. Uh, just a side remark, Jyotish is uh, Vedic astrology. It consumes me, but it is also my joy, and I know it is the right thing to do if I want to get somewhere. My problem is I've become reclusive. When the loneliness is too much, I try to get out there and meet people, but somehow I always find myself thinking I'd rather be at home studying. Another thing in social context is that I tend to minimize what I'm about to order, what, what I am about in order to fit in. It's an attitude I can't sustain in the long run since I'm not fully being myself. So eventually, this ardency feels both like a blessing and a curse. And I guess I would like to know how to navigate it better with regard to reclusiveness. Because I've come to realize that they're closely associated, you mentioned how great practitioners can't speak about anything else than their practice and won't deviate from it, but they live in secluded places and aren't really fit for society. Well, I'm only a normal person, and so I need to compromise, but it's not working very well. One area or the other suffers, and it's going back and forth. The core of the question is really about how to persevere, in brackets, ardency, on one's path, in brackets, be it what I do or meditation, etc. That requires a good amount of discipline and live a normal life at the same time. Normal is in quotes. All right. I think really this is a question of conflict and thus a striving for harmony within one's being. And it's, uh, I think, one of the most fundamental conflicts within any spiritual practitioner's life. You're moving into one direction in your life, let's say. Uh, that direction, usually for most people, is a direction that branches out into the senses. So we have incredible attraction to the senses, experiencing the sight, sound, smell, taste, thoughts, and so on. So usually the mind, the awareness uh, streams, it flows out into the experience of the sense realm and has great interest to do that because it thinks that it can find happiness there. It can find pleasure, joy. Yes. Otherwise we wouldn't do it. So, in essence, we are continuously looking for pleasant sense experiences and try to avoid unpleasant ones. That's our main activity. So we're occupied with. The spiritual path is the complete opposite of that. You basically move away from the senses to that which is aware of those senses. The direction is completely different. So rather than asking myself, what am I aware of? I'd ask myself, what is it that's aware? So that's the direction. It goes, as many masters of the past have said, it kind of goes against the grain. You go against the stream. The entire stream of the world goes to the left. It goes towards the chasing of sense pleasures, the chasing of thought, which also includes time, like trying to find yourself in the future at some place that is more meaningful than this, better than this, more desirable than this, 
because right now you're not yet complete. That's the idea of this, uh, one of the fundamental ideas of delusion is basically you're not complete, you're incomplete, you, you must somehow complete yourself. In order to do that, you must add as many experiences as possible onto yourself so that eventually those experiences will somehow complete you. But that's not true. It's not true that you can be completed through experiences. If that was the case, we would be already long uh, complete. It's much more the delusion that we are incomplete and that we don't know ourselves as we truly are that kind of pr propagates this seeking for something else. Okay? So these are the, the two directions. I'm mentioning this to, to show this fundamental conflict that spiritual practitioners usually have. At least most people that I know, including myself, that's it. It really boils down to that. Why am I so distracted? Well, it boils down to that. You're more interested in the world than you're interested in silence. And it's that interest that keeps pulling you back into the noise and the changing environments of your senses constantly. And so it's this conflict. There's part of your interest that goes out into the world, but there's also some interest towards what's beyond that. The interest is in, it's a, it's a clear interest in how do I find an end of suffering? How do I get out of my problems, my stress, my difficulties, and so on? And, and then usually that's that interest that pulls you the other way. But for a beginner, that interest is usually super weak because you basically don't know what it means. Like, who am I beyond the senses? I have no idea. It's a complete unknown to me. So how would I want something that I don't know? Versus, and that's the competition, what you already know to give you the quick fix. You could just go to the fridge. You could just turn on the TV. You could just watch uh, YouTube clips. And that's the familiar thing that gives you a quick solution, quick respite. You find some short rest. You don't have to do much to do that. You just do the thing that you already know. And you might even understand that that doesn't solve the problem for good. In fact, it creates many other problems in the course of following that. It usually comes with a rat's tail of other things. It's pulling it behind it. Like if you continuously watch YouTube clips, that comes with problems of addiction, sleeplessness, confusion in the mind, depression, all the kind of stuff that's mentioned in scientific articles about social media addiction and, and all that kind of stuff, right? So you get a bit of entertainment, but you also get tons of problems coming with it. So worldly pleasures are in general like that. And it's really important to continuously reflect on that and to understand that and to kind of educate our own mind in terms of what is really good for it and what's not good for it. And that requires continuous education. There's no way around it. You continuously need to indoctrinate your own mind um, in, in a way that it's good for it. In a way you need to brainwash yourself. Because otherwise you would just do what you've been told is good for you. You just repeat what you repeated yesterday and the year before and so on. Endlessly. So in order to truly change, we need to understand the benefit of changing. We also need to understand the downfalls of not changing. Uh, we need to teach our own mind again and again. We need to contemplate. And that's no, no easy task. I find that to be the most difficult one because there is this huge competition between all the pleasures of the world. It's all glittering. It's all golden. It's all such a nice possibility that's out there. It's waiting for you. You just need to go get it. 
And it isn't also that hard to get there, usually. You don't have to do much. And then there is the unknown, the other direction. And then usually also people have a lot of ideas about this other direction. For example, in my case, I'm happy to share with you, um, my own idea about being a meditator, like a proper meditator, like deep, profound style meditator kind of comes with the idea that it would strip my life completely of fun. That's a wrong idea. Yes, but it's, it's super sticky in the mind. It's like, okay, if I, if I was one of those guys that really went full on into the spiritual path, I'd have to renounce the world and renouncing the world somehow means to me renouncing all the fun and becoming like a boring person that you can't have any fun with. And then I would lose my wife. I would lose my home. <laughs> I become some guy that kind of lives on a grain of rice a day in a cave somewhere. And it's just dreadful. This, this whole image is like really dreadful. Because it, it, this image, to me, it takes away everything I like. You know, watching a movie on Saturday night, chilling out, going on a holiday, a vacation, you know, visiting friends, having nice conversations, laughter, you know, all that's kind of gone. It's dreadful. And so I, I don't want to go there because to me the meaning that I've assigned to this spiritual path, the secret meaning, the underneath kind of hidden meaning, is one of loneliness, boredom. What's other words? Like stale, gray, flat, clinical, something like that. How would I want to go there then? But then there is more conscious aspects of my mind that say it's going to be great when you are going to be a meditator because then you experience much more deep much more profound sense of fun and aliveness and goodness and so on. And then the other part of my psyche comes up and says, you know, that's not true. You've seen meditators. You've seen how boring they were. You could, they, were they didn't laugh when you made a joke. They were just looking at you mindfully. And then you felt like an idiot, right? Remember? That's how you're going to be. And then the other part of the psyche says, yeah, but my teacher told me that. And the other part comes in again, yeah, come on. You know the truth. <laughs> so here you have a conflict between two aspects of the psyche. And that's usually not it for any of us. There is a massive amount of voices within you that all pull into different directions. And that's what this is about, the, this question. At least in my opinion, it's, it's about a conflict between I want to do this, but I also want to do that. And if I do this more, I'm going to lose some of that. And if I'm going to do this more, then I'm going to lose some of this. So that there is some fear of losing something. Very likely it's going to be pleasure and fun and excitement and so on. And then on the other side, there is a promise of gaining something too. And that comes with a certain faith because you don't exactly know what you're in for. Because it's an unknown. That's why I think the spiritual path is the hardest thing ever. Because it goes against the grain. Completely. It goes against habits. It goes against preferences. And it, I think it should be based on a very clear comprehension of suffering. If you, the more deep your understanding of suffering is, plus an understanding that it is the spiritual path indeed that can liberate you from that. If you have some experience also that backs it up, it will strengthen your faith. So in the beginning, you just do a little bit of meditation. You notice, ah, it gets a little bit better. 
that fuels your faith together with the contemplation that that trend may go on. Then it may deepen. And it pulls you deeper, slowly, gradually. Then another problem, so I've written down a couple of things here, a couple of notes. So the first one, the first point is about finding balance. It's important to remove the conflict as much as you can, and that you can do this by understanding the importance of both of those aspects. It's not an all or nothing thing, but to the mind often it is. I'm either going to practice Vedic astrology or I'm going to uh, have fun with friends. It, it doesn't seem to go together in the mind. It doesn't seem to be combinable or unitable or in a way um, perhaps even supporting one another. And so I think it's a good idea to contemplate like this, that just like you need sleep at night so you can perform during the day, so you perform during the day so you deserve rest at night. We have this, they both support one another, like the, the classic yin-yang symbol, right? one leads to the other. So I'd say, how about the times you spend with your friends are meaningful in that way that they recharge you, that they give you pleasure, happiness, all those things that you still really need so that you can then enjoy your studies and that you can actually make progress in your studies. Because otherwise, if you were to strip yourself from actually spending time with your friends and enjoying yourself, having a good time, you'd end up depressed. And then being depressed and good luck with studying Vedic astrology, no chance, because why would you want to do this? You're already burned out, drained, unhappy. And if you're unhappy, then there is no studying. So you need to have a certain degree of happiness and joy in your life so that you can make progress on the spiritual path. And it's a fine balance. <clears throat> the reason why I'm still here after a while of doing this is because I know how to play and enjoy myself. And I take that very seriously. Over the years, I have given up a little bit this concept of a rush, of being fast in my progress, and instead, I want to be correct in my progress. So there's a shift over from trying to rush on getting results quickly to doing the causes right, practicing correctly, and having more emphasis on the quality of what I do. And I notice that I do need certain conditions to be there, to practice well. One of those conditions is pleasure, happiness, just enjoying life the normal way. Going out with friends, watching a movie, you name it. I need this because if I take too much away from it, I'm becoming, uh, what is the word? It's a, it's a pressure. It makes the mind unhappy. Now here's what's important. When the mind is unhappy and pressurized a little bit, that's fine as long as you can transform it. So that's the rule of thumb. You have to take some of the pleasures away because they interfere with the path. So you need to do it really cleverly. You need to be wise about it. Take some away, some of the interferences, but not too much. Because if you can't handle what you're taking away anymore, you're breaking your progress on the path. And if you just keep too much of the pleasures and distractions and entertainments, also you can't progress. So you need to find a way of slow, gradual progress. And eventually that hole that, that arises is filled up by your practice. So let's say I meditate a little bit more and I distract myself a little bit less 
eventually that hole will be filled through my spiritual practice. Because I'm dealing with the underlying suffering that made me go into distraction in the first place. That way, I would advocate for balance in that regard. That's quite important. So don't think it's either one or the other. And you have to make your decision tomorrow, whether it's Vedic astrology or friends. It's not all that dramatic at all. It can be both. And in my opinion, it should be both. Otherwise, you're going to starve yourself somewhere. If you can't handle that starvation, that's the end of anything. Second one is quality over quantity. Yes, I mentioned that before. Prioritize quality. There's no rush. The, the quantity here would be trying to get somewhere fast in time. Rather than, let me do this really well now. Okay, create a priority there helps with this conflict too, because there is no need for you to make a decision right now. All there is really, that, all that's needed really is to orient yourself in accordance with your higher purpose now. And just keep doing that. You don't have to make these kind of decisions for like, from now on until the end of 2024, I'm going to be perfect in all my endeavors or something like that. Instead, right now, how can I orient the mind in a way that's beneficial and reduces harm to myself without breaking myself and without indulging, overly indulging too much so that I can't progress either. Okay, third point. Yeah, resolving conflict. The more united your psyche is, Tanis Arubikui, for example, speaks of a committee in our heads, a committee in the mind, varying voices, and they're usually in conflict, and they give you suggestions. Hey, you could be doing this, you could be doing that. Um, and it's like 20, 30 people that give you all suggestions. So who are you listening to? And again, you have to be wise. You can't just completely cut off the unskillful voices. A lot of people think, oh, I have a lot of unskillful voices in this committee, like go eat chocolate, go distract yourself, go, uh, you know, get completely drunk or whatever. Um, these unskillful voices, we know them as unskillful voices, we know them as harmful. And then we hear about these kind of teachings and we get a teaching that's super inspired. And then we go, okay, I should not have any unskillful voices in my head anymore. I should completely cut listening to them. Well, good luck with that. Because what you're about to do is create a rebellion against yourself. If you completely cut off one side of the entire committee, which is a 50%, perhaps even more, and you just kind of completely ignore them, they will find a way to get through to you. And if it is through rebellion, like the farmers are currently doing in Europe, spraying manure on the government buildings, right? That's the result of suppressing and pushing away and disregarding. Rebellion is always the result of not being heard. Another form of rebellion within your own psychology would be a nightmare. It's like when you're nicely defenseless in your bed, your psyche can get through to you and you can't do anything about it. You can't distract yourself or run away. Perfect opportunity to get the message through. Because otherwise you just keep ignoring it, right? That's a form of rebellion. And your mind will make sure to get through to you. And if it is through accidents and illness and so on and so forth, to get that message through. So we need to hear them out. You can't just disregard unwholesome opinions within yourself. You have to take them into consideration and actually understand where they come from and then deal with the underlying issue to resolve it. A lot of that is done through the practice of loving kindness and compassion. 
There's, if there's a lot of healing that can happen through that alone. That is something that unites the psyche. When right now our psyche may be really split and you have a lot of parts pulling into different directions, how do you unite them? Well, through love and through compassion, through understanding and through listening to all of them equally. Not just disregarding it. Like if, if your mind says, I want chocolate, and you, you tell it, stop being stupid. There is an underlying desire behind it. Why do you want chocolate? Ask. See where it takes you. Keep asking. Then your mind will give you an answer. Ask why. Until you have no more answers left. Just keep asking why. Write it down on a piece of paper until you truly understand what it is that moves you. And then address that. So that's how you resolve this kind of conflict between the parties. Number four is company. This is one of the most important points, actually, is the company you keep. If you hang out with people who are actively doing what I just talked about, who are actively resolving their conflicts or becoming more um, unified within their being, and who are successfully dealing with their troubles and difficulties in a good way, so there is a steady growth in what's wholesome and a steady decline in what's unwholesome. You associate with people like that, that's basically, the, that could be the only point to mention, really. You, you become like those you hang out with all the time. So if you hang out with people who are dealing with these issues in a wise way, it will do the same to you. Number five, is your sense of purpose, because it's a conflict of purpose, especially with these deeper questions. Should I study Vedic astrology, or should I study the Dharma and, and go deeper into the Buddhist teachings? And no, it's really meaningful, it's very deep, but then there are so many pleasures. It's a sense of purpose, and the way I reflect on this, at least on the path of meditation, is quite straightforward. You remember that you will die, one. That's really important. You're heading towards death really fast. You're like in a fast train, in a dark tunnel, racing towards a wall. You just don't know when the wall will come, because it's dark. If you truly understood that that's your real situation actually right now, would you still want to invest your time and your energy in things that don't really matter? Would you still argue about, I don't know, politics with your loved ones or something like that? Like it's, it becomes like a silly thing if you're confronted with the fact that you are going to lose everything that you love, that you're attached to. And you don't know when and you don't know how. You only know you're in a fast train right now. The wall's right ahead. But what that does to me is immediately it makes my heart sink actually. It gives me a feeling of, oh, it, it straightens out my priorities instantly. Like it, it helps me to let go of what is actually harmful to me and it makes me want to cultivate what's, what's good for me. It, it aligns me with my purpose almost instantly. Because all the, the things that are not really worthwhile of being my purpose they fall away if I reflect on death. Like it's my purpose to hop around on the world and visit as many countries as I can. If that's, your, if that's your true purpose, would it still be your true purpose if you consider that you're in that fast train? Or would you have different things come up? Another reflection I like is the reflection of being in a vast river that pulls you around and you're kind of like a leaf in that river so you're, you're not really deciding where to go but the river is the, the currents are and sometimes fair enough the currents are kind of weak and nice and pleasant and so you can swim a little bit from left to right but it won't stay that way. Soon enough there will be more heavy currents, there will be waterfalls and rocks and perhaps some poisonous animals in the water or something like that. 
if you knew that this was ahead with certainty, would you still want to remain in the river? Would you still have interest in river stuff? Would water still be your only goal? Or would you suddenly turn to the shore, to what's actually granting safety, was actually safe, yes? I would immediately turn towards the shore, immediately. If I knew that this river is going to pull me downstream into a white water or something like this, if I could see it, if I could just see it, I'd really get my act together right now. So I immediately align myself with my higher purpose, like that. But if I forget, I love the water. It's beautiful. Swim around, swim to the left, swim to the right, because right now I can. Life is smooth right now. When your life is smooth right now, remember it's a trap. It won't stay smooth. But I know how hard it is to convince yourself that it won't stay smooth because you're really attached to the smooth ride. So it's fairly difficult to convince your mind that it won't stay smooth because the mind hates that idea. It wants to move out. Yes. So it's really important to understand and to remind yourself in such ways over and over again, because otherwise you'll be occupied with things that don't really don't really matter to you. I can guarantee that it, it, it's not just stuff that matters to me that I'm talking about. It is what matters to you personally. Because we have this tendency of losing sight of what truly matters to ourselves and get lost in things that don't actually matter that much. So we have a lot of conflicting desires that pull us left and right. To end that conflict, you have to know your true purpose and you have to re realign yourself with it on a daily basis. The Buddha, for example, suggests these five reflections. I'm subject to old age, illness, death, to losing whatever I love, what I'm attached to. And I'm also owner of my actions. And I'm heir to the results of my actions. So the first four points are what's ahead. Old age, illness, death loss of the loved things. The last point is your power. It's in your actions, in your decisions, in your awareness right now. That's your chance to align yourself with a higher purpose. Well, that's why we should do these kind of reflections often to align ourselves. It resolves conflict. Okay, so that's all that comes to mind for that topic. I hope that was helpful. We hope you enjoyed this episode and had a meaningful time. For more information and upcoming events, head over to our website at phuket-meditation.com. Thank you very much for listening and have a wonderful day.